welcome back after break. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, uh, if we look at the course web page and the exercises and my getting started guide and the hello world first hello world recording this one those are not updated with using ECMAScript modules in those I am using a uh, common JS modules and require and import so don't copy me on that one when you look at this one uh, so uh, I, I will do a new recording probably tomorrow maybe Friday so there will be new recordings but when you get started yes yes get, please get started with exercises just remember that ec the exercises are you are meant to use ECMAScript modules in those and it will work but you will not be able to get it to work with require and import anymore. Um, well, you could, you could do that as well, but you need to add it to the index.html. I could actually show you. So if I go into the exercise tiny tunes library uh, repository, and we look, this is the repository, we look in the source folder, then we have an index.html. And in that index.html, you will see on line five that it says script type module source uh, uh, JS app.js. So, so this is utilizing the new uh, ECMAScript module. Webpack will still build a bundle, uh, but that bundle is served down here with a no module attribute as build.js and this one will work in older browsers as well but that is nothing you need to think about actually just remember to use the new ECMAScript modules and you'll be fine okay let's start to uh, write some code then because now we know how to link our JavaScripts to the web pages now we need to start to do some magic and we will do this magic by using something called a DOM uh, this is what we will do today oh yeah so this lecture was <laughs> I've split things up this lecture was actually this is today it's half a lecture but it will take two hours uh, so I've split a, a lecture I had with uh, had DOM and event handling in it before and this is this one I will do a recording of until next week but we will look at the DOM today and the DOM is a tree representation of an HTML page and the HTML nodes the elements on the page uh, so if you look at your right hand side you see the HTML code I've stripped some attributes and things but um, just simple HTML and this is actually represented with a data structure in the browser and that data structure is called the DOM and the DOM is a tree so we, we can't have circular references for instance you can't place a p tag inside of a body that is inside the same p tag that makes no sense and you cannot do that so hence this is a tree and it's it I think you can map this quite quite easy we have uh, a special element in the top called a document the document object and on this document object you have an HTML element being this one we have a in the HTML we have a head and we have a body inside of the head we have a title in this case inside of the title we have a text node, text element. I uh, think you can map this quite easily. Uh, the DOM is not only a tree representation of the HTML page, it's also the API against um, the document when we use in JavaScript. So this is the API that we will use to work with elements on a page. 
Do you see something on the right hand side that is not represented on the left hand side? The closing tags, yeah. So in this case, those are the yellow ones are called elements. And an element is a starting tag and a closing tag. So that is what makes up the element. We have, once again. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually, it's actually the same order here. So this is an arrayish, it's a node list, it's a list of every, every level is a list. And this list, I'm pretty sure, will be consistent with the order in the HTML. So this being the, the, the zero element, first element and second element being represented in that case. And I've, yeah, so, so we have some kind of order. Anything else missing? The yeah, the attributes. The, we have the href and the source attribute. Uh, they are not shown here, but they are actually part of each and every element. Anything else miss it? Yeah. And this is quite a tricky one that has dealt a lot of headaches for, for web developers during the years. White spaces are missing. Uh, this really whoa <laughs> looks like this because when you develop you tend to press enter after an element you you tend to have spaces indenting and all of those uh, are actually elements in this structure so it actually the, the correct representation is this one um, each and every element is showing. So, so if I were to ask how many elements has the body, you would probably say, oh, three children. But it actually got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children because it includes the white spaces. Going back to the war between Netscape and Microsoft, what if we can... So Microsoft have had quite a pragmatic view of, of, of making things in the browser. They saw this and they said, there is never a developer that is interested in all of those white spaces. So Microsoft stripped them away. Did the other browsers do that? Did the standard do that? No. So in Firefox, the body would have seven elements or seven, seven children child elements. In Internet Explorer it had three. And I mean it's irritating to work with those extra elements of course, but it's even more irritating to working with two browsers that give you different, a different uh, representation of the DOM. But that is what happened. This is the standard way of describing the DOM and this is the way it is described uh, nowadays. Uh, however, uh, as we will see, we have some API, s separate API calls for getting only the element nodes or also getting all text nodes. But we will have a look at that soon. I've represented those elements and, and nodes. I mean, a node, I got a question on this last year. A node is just a, uh, something in this tree. This is nodes. The blue ones and the yellow ones are all nodes in, in the document object model. However, the yellow ones are called element nodes. And element nodes are like H1, script, P, A, yeah, the usual elements. The blue ones are called text nodes. Uh, we have comment nodes and doc the, the special document node. You will probably not work with those uh, on an everyday basis at least. However, you will work with element and text nodes. They also have a value you can, uh, you can if, you, if you get a node and you don't know what it is, you can always look at its value and see if it has the node value of one, then you know it's an element. If it has the node value of three, then you know that it is a text element. And this was really useful 
when you had to like filter away all of those extra text nodes because if you were to iterate over all the children in the body you could have an if statement saying okay so if the, uh, the uh, node is of type text ignore it and only work with the elements and that was the way you had to do it working with plain JavaScript uh, but when we had those problems we also had libraries like jQuery that took care of things like this and problems like this but we don't need jQuery today uh, traversing is a fancy word for walking uh, walking and uh, navigating through the nodes I mean you, you could whoa sorry you could end up in in, 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 in some circumstance that you you have a reference to the body node body element and you want to to visit all or do something with all of the child nodes to the body node so if we have a reference to the body node being this top node on the top of the page we could call for instance start this one first child so if we have the node dot first child we will get a new reference to this node the first node the, the first child node however first child and last child they will point you to the first the, the first node whatever node in this case this being a text node so in the newer uh, implementation of the DOM we have something called first element child and this one is probably the one you will need the most because you are often interested in elements so if you call first element child you will get the P element or, or what it was in the, in the last slide but if you call first child you will only get the, the text element uh, when you are on a node you can always call parent node and you will get to the its parent no need for parent element because it's only elements that could have children um, you can use previous element sibling and next element sibling to go between siblings and you can also use uh, uh, node dot children to get a nodes all children nodes uh, and that will only get children <laughs> will only get element nodes the older one child nodes will get all nodes including the text nodes yep yeah yeah I, I've excluded them actually there is a previous sibling and a next sibling but in reality you s very seldom use them if you're not if your job is not to if you're writing an editor for instance you will probably need to use them because you want to probably do something with the indentation in the editor but in normal circumstances you will probably use previous element sibling and next element sibling so so you can always if you have a reference to an element you can always find your way <laughs> around the whole HTML element and, and f get somewhere else if, if, if your task is to change with JavaScript this a elements href you want to change the href to something else using JavaScript and you have a reference to that image do you think it's a good practice to do parent node last sibling first child first element child is that a way good way of, of like doing things like that you're shaking your head no because this is really prone to if someone inserts an element somewhere in this child list on the body it will break your your application more or less so there are certain circumstances when you need to like traverse the DOM often it's more like this a element has an image element inside of it or this list element has an a element and you got a reference to the list element well use first element child then and you, uh, you get a reference to the the a element inside of the list but that is pretty much it 
you you never want to like walk a long path inside of the HTML document if you're not creating some special kind of tool or something. But in, in normal circumstances, you do not want to do that. Um, a better way is trying to select the node you need uh, when you need it. Yeah, oh well, one more thing on this one. I've kind of illustrated this as an array of nodes. And you can look at it as kind of an array of nodes, but it is not an array. So you could, if you have your children, you can use brackets and you can select the first one by writing a zero inside of the brackets and you will get the first one in the list. But this is something called a node list. And a node list and an array ha do not share prototypes. I will get back to that, but just, just bear in mind that this is called a node list and not an array. Um, that would be quite important. Okay, if we want to select a specific node on the page, you can kind of draw the par parallel to, to the, the style sheets or CSS. When you write CSS, you need to select something to be able to... to, to change that element. We have three uh, 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 methods. One called get element by ID, get elements by tag name, get elements by class name. So those three uh, uh, methods can be used to extract uh, specific elements or get a reference to a specific element inside of the DOM. Get element by ID will give you Will it give you a list or will it give you one object, one node? Yeah, it says so on the slide even. One node. Why, why, why only one? ID is considered to be unique. Yeah, IDs, we, and we said this in the CSS uh, uh, lecture, IDs as an attribute on an HTML element must be unique on the page. However, in CSS you can cheat, you can have many IDs, and if you say, say says that those IDs should be read, they will be read, for instance. However, in JavaScript you can't cheat, because get element by ID will only uh, return a node element. Maybe the first one, maybe the last one, I don't know. You should never get in a situation where you have to depend on some, having, having the same ID twice on a page. Always unique. Get elements by tag name. Well, an indication is that, okay, it says elements. You will get a node list back. You will get one of those lists back with all elements of a certain tag. So if you, I have an example down here. If you do a document dot get elements by tag name P, you will get all the P elements on the page as a node list. One important thing that I actually noticed when I were, was on the train, I didn't know this, but I learned today, so, so I, I better tell you guys as well. It could be important in certain, certain circumstances. If you're using those, you will get a live list back. So the node list you get from get elements by tag name is kind of live in the document. That meaning, if you, for instance, want to it, okay, you, you found all the P elements on the page, and you want to iterate over each and every P element and convert that P element to a div. You can do that. I don't know why you would like to do that, but you can. Then you need to remember that this node list is live. So if you do a P, uh, get element by tag name P, you get a reference to the first P, P element. You convert it to a div, hence you remove the P element. Then this list will remove that as well, and you have one less element in the list. So if you do that in a for loop, and you text, take the next node, then you will actually skip one node, because that node will be shifted. So if you want to iterate over that kind of, of, of of list, you should actually start from the back and work your way forward. 
if you don't want to miss anything. Or do it in, you can work with the first one until the array is empty, uh, node list is empty if you like. Uh, but this is a live update as soon as you kind of do a change, it will re-render and this list will be another list. The same goes for get elements by class name. Um, I think I said in the CSS lecture, please use classes. If you, if you want the behavior or, or add behavior to something that everything should be grayed out or inactive, use a class and then we could add JavaScript to get all those nodes and do something with them. And we get an example, let tags document get elements by class name post and we log the length. So we see, okay, we have 12 posts on the, this page, for instance, you can calculate stuff. <coughs> Those are pretty, I mean, get element by ID, that is commonly used, it's been in the standard forever. Uh, get elements by tag name as well. Get elements by class name. I'm, 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 I'm feeling old if I say that it's new because it was new in like 2005 or something like that. But, but it's, not, it's not been in the standard all the time. This was, was a really good use case for jQuery as well because you often use jQuery to get, get elements based on that class. Okay, but there is another way, yeah. Uh, no, I don't. You're, 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 you're referring to the live update. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I just, I watched, I think I watched a video. F no, I read in the book. Yeah, it says in the literature, actually. I read, the, I read the course literature and it actually says that it's live updated. I, I've, I've, to I, I've, I've programmed in JavaScript for, I don't know how many years and I've never had a problem with it. So but they, they apparently are. Uh, what is not updated live is uh, a newer API called the Selectus API. And, and this one, I, I would probably recommend you using this because then you have one API for doing whatever you, you need to do. And if you're used to writing, which you should be, writing CSS selectors, the style selectors, then you can use this API for it's the same selectors that you have in CSS, the same standard, is being used for those as well. So instead, if you would like to find all, find the element with the ID main, you do a document.query selector. Query selector, the first one, will give you a node element back. Query selector all will give you a list back. But we do a query selector of the main and we will get the reference to that node. And query selector all, and we write a P, then we will get all the P elements back on the, uh, from the page. Of course, we can do it like this, query, combine selectors, P dot tag will give us all P elements with a class tag. What happens if we separate? Descendants. Yeah, all descendants of a P tag, a P element with a class set to tag. So, so simple, classical CSS selectors and you can I can use I guess more or less all CSS selectors in, in inside of of this API this will not give you live uh, live uh, uh, node list back so what, what this will do is with you get a, a node list you can work with that node list and after your code returns the re-rendering will be we will be executed so in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, but so when you get this live view back, it must update the DOM in the background somehow. And that, that I'm confused about, but whatever. Use this API in normal circumstances and you'll be fine. Uh, it's a pretty simple API. This as well, ha how many has coded in jQuery before? Yeah, so, so, so if you have used jQuery, this was like one of the big things with jQuery that you were able to select elements using uh, CSS selectors. So, so it was adopted by, by V3C, I guess, and put into the standard. Um, 
yeah, as I said, the node list that you get back using one of those elements, uh, th those methods, is not an array. Uh, as last as two years ago, you could not use a for each iterator on a node list because for each iterators were on the array prototype but not on the node list prototype. However, now you can. You can do a pta no node list dot for each and, and use the iterator function for each on node lists. However, you cannot use map, for instance, reduce, filter because they are not implemented on the node list prototype. Y an easy way to get around that is to convert the node list to an array. And you can do that by using the array from method. So in this case, I have a node list, the p tags node list. I send it into array from, and I get an array of references to the nodes. Uh, and now I can iterate using map and reduce and whatever, if I like. Um, filter. In normal circumstances, you are probably good with for each, but filter could be quite good to have sometimes. You want to filter out some certain elements, depending uh, with, with, uh, with something you, you maybe can't do with a selectors API. Uh, okay, questions so far? This, this, this part of the lecture is quite boring because there's only a lot of API calls and I uh, uh, usually hate lecturing in APIs because it's, it's kind of boring. But the DOM API is such, a, such an important one that I actually would like to, to go through it. Um, this one is particularly boring, so, so uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go over it fast. I, I, I just want you to know that you can do those things and it's really easy to, check, uh, to find examples of how to do it. But of course you can modify the DOM. You can take an element from one position and move it to another posi position. You can insert new elements and you can remove old elements. I mean that is, look in Slack for instance, that is a big web app as I said before. If someone starts to write something, you will see dot 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 <laughs> is writing something. Of course, that is only DOM handling. Uh, as soon as someone is writing something, an object is in, a node is inserted with an animated GIF or some whatever, and uh, the text is added that someone is writing something. And as soon as it stops, they remove that element. It, it's as simple as that. Whoa, okay. Manipulation of the DOM. You can add nodes and you use uh, the API called append child. So if you have a node and you append a child to the node, yeah, the new node will become a child of this node. And it will be appended at, uh, at the end of the list. If the new node is present in another place in the DOM, it will be removed from that place and moved. Because a, new, uh, a node cannot be in two places at the same time in a DOM structure. It's a tree, so you cannot, cannot, cannot have any circular uh, dependencies. So if you append it, it will be removed from somewhere else, or if it's a new node, it's uh, yeah, it's not in the DOM from the beginning, so, so it will not be removed any from anywhere uh, th in that case. You have something called insert before, so if you don't want it to end up last in a list, you can use insert before and it, you can place it exactly where you want it. Then you need a reference to the before node, so the node you want to insert it before. You can replace nodes. You can remove nodes and you can make clones of nodes. And this one is quite important that we will see soon. Uh, so if I take a node, for instance, remember the body node, for instance, or body element. If I clone the body element, I will get a new body element. And if I set, set, uh, send in true, 
then I will make a deep copy. So I will get a, uh, get a copy of each and every element and their children and their children. So I will get a copy of a part of the DOM tree. And then I could insert this copy somewhere else. Body being a bad example because you should only have one body element. But the, if, if you have a div element, for instance, you can, uh, you can duplicate it and, and, and insert it somewhere else. Uh, remember just that you can make a shallow or deep copy uh, of that node tree. You can create nodes out of nothing. Um, you have the document create element, which will create a new element node. You just say if what you want it to be called. You can create a document text node, uh, which, will, which will create a text node for you. Yep. Yeah. So, so the question is: Is it possible to create another uh, uh, a whole page, or do you need to create each and every element uh, on its own? You will see soon. Uh, because in this case, well, if you want to do it all from the beginning with a blank page, you will build up a big HTML page. Then you could actually start off by, okay, create element HTML. Okay, create element head. Append child head into HTML. Create element title. Append title into head. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think you will get a question answered soon. Uh, so th so, it's, so it, it's, it's really not the same thing because that is probably done server-side. Uh, generating a web, web application, uh, you could do that in JavaScript on the client as well if you like. Uh, you would not probably not use this method because that would be, you will see, quite cumbersome. Uh, but we remember, we can create nodes. Uh, there are shortcuts though, uh, remember um, Microsoft wants to do things easy for the developers, so many of the API calls that we have in the language that are short are Microsoft, many that we have in the, the language that are longer, it's often V3C. Uh, text content and in the HTML is Microsoft implementations of uh, I think both of them, at least in our HTML. We can do something like this. Instead of creating a text node and appending the text node inside of the element, which is like a free liner or something, oh, two liner, you create the text node, append it in, inside of the element. You can use, just do element dot text content equals, and you will create a text node inside of the element. If the element is not empty, if it has child nodes, those will be erased and you will be replaced with a text node. On the same thing you can do in your HTML to add HTML to an element. So you could more or less write a lot of HTML here and just insert it into an element and that will generate a doom structure. This, this text will be interpreted and rendered exactly the same way as if you write source code. So, so if you do something wrong, the browser will correct you because it cannot create falsy code in the DOM. Um, however, beware of inner HTML. I, I would almost go as far as telling you not to use it in the course because if you're, if you're using it because you think it's just easier than doing other stuff, then you might get into trouble because it will not, it, things can happen with event handlers and stuff that you don't expect. Uh, there are also security issues. As, as soon as you see injected code somewhere, you should always think security issues because if you, if you take code in the text format and try to insert it and get it interpreted, somewhere, you can get an error. Maybe this text is coming from Twitter or some trusted partner 
and you think it's okay and, and, and suddenly they have a leak and someone is injecting code on Twitter and you get this and it's injected in your site as well. So beware of inner HTML because it's a little bit so-so. Uh, I will get back to better ways soon. Attributes. Uh, of course, when you create an element, you want to attach attributes, you want to add attributes, you want to be able to read the attributes of an element. You have get attribute, set attribute, and remove attribute. Quite a simple API. That's what you expect it, expect it to do. Have an example, we're creating an image. On the image, we want to add a source element, source attribute, sorry, to point to image picture SVG. And then we do a query selector for main and we append the new tag being the image and we append the image to the page. When this code returns, or let's go up the main thread, often it means it returns and it's done executing, then this will be generated and rendered. And since an, a new image has arised inside of the document, the browser will uh, make a network call for that image, loading that image and inserting it into the browser. So, so this picture.svg is not there from the beginning, but as soon as this code returns, it will be fetched over the network. Uh, there are shorthands. Microsoft did a shorthand that you could like write, in this case, new tag dot src equals without using the set attribute. Uh, however, there are problems with that one. If you want to set the CSS class, you cannot write dot class because class is a reserved word. So then you have some workarounds for that. I would say always use this standardized API, even though it might be a couple of more characters to write sometimes. And now I'm not doing it with styles, but whatever, I, I will, uh, I'm always saying I will show a better way. I will, I promise. In, in the end, we will just show one way of doing this. And you, but you will probably need to use those um, ways sometimes. So what I'm doing here, I'm selecting uh, an element called discovery. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter. And then I change it co its color to that one by calling node.style.color. This is an API that Microsoft did as well. Um, and then I changed the color like that. Is that a good way of doing it? No, you, you should always say no when I ask that question. You know that now. And that is exactly the same thing as doing that. Like adding the style attribute to the element itself. And, and, and we learned that we shouldn't do that. Uh, not only that, since the one creating CSS was not a developer, that person injected dashes inside of the words instead of doing camel casing uh, like any other normal uh, developer would do. Uh, so in this case, it says font, it's dash, right? Yeah, dash size uh, in CSS. But when using this this way, we need to do font capitalized S is for size. We have a CSS property called float. Float is a reserved word in JavaScript, so you need to add CSS float. And there are more like this, and it's just quite cumbersome to remember. And you should never do this anyway. Or there is one certain circumstance when it's actually a good thing to do that, or you might be, be forced to do that. And that is if you like, for instance, to move something over the screen using JavaScript following the mouse or whatever, you might be forced to dynamically update, for instance, left and top on the style to do this kind of movement. Um, there are probably better, there are certainly libraries that do does this for you, but if you want to do it in raw JavaScript, I guess that is the way you have to do it. But we are trying to strive for separating structure, presentation and behavior. And doing things like this, this is mixing it all up again. Uh, in certain circumstances, okay, but 
those are exceptions. How you should do that with styles is like this. You should use classes, CSS classes. So instead we do something like this. We create uh, or we query and get a reference to the discovery element. And on that element we use the class list API to add a class. So we add a class, CSS class, to that element and we have the code for, for that what, what those kinds of elements should look like in the CSS. So in the HTML it will look something like this class whatever and j is changed. Since I'm using this class list and, and doing add, add will add the j is changed. It will not overwrite if there is something there already. And in, in class attributes you can separate different classes with uh, 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 a space. And in the CSS I have a class that I call j is changed. And as soon as this p element will get that class it will also get the CSS rule applied so it will change its color. Now this is a really basic example. Of course, it would probably be a lot more CSS happening. For instance, a border appearing and a shadow and whatever. But um, it's just an example. On class lists, you have class list add. You have remove, will remove. Not all of them, they, you will remove a specific class. You can toggle a class. This one is particularly useful. So often you want something to be on or off with a class. It should have the class. If it, has the, if it don't have the class, it should add a class. If it has the class, it should remove the class. And that is toggling. So you could ask it to toggle. J is changed. So if it had it, remove it. If it have, haven't got it, add it. And you can check if this list of class uh, contains a specific class if you want to examine that. We will get back to this one uh, during the peer instru instruction in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so, so this is a simple example. You can all, if you look at this, it's, it's simple. You have a div element with post elements and you have some UL element with list elements containing a, a, a elements. It's, it's quite obvious, right? Okay. I, I actually don't think that is obvious. It's, it's, it's hard to read. It's hard to visualize because it's just duh, a mess of, of, of code. That actually looks like that. Div class post ul list class active a href the first link the second link that HTML if you ignore the templates is the same thing as all of those API calls and this is getting closer to your question now because this is not a good way of doing it because you will I mean you it's so easy to make something wrong to add like the attribute on the wrong element or, or add it inside of the wrong element. Uh, th this is a much cleaner representation to write the HTML in HTML. And that is why we have something called templates. Uh, so we can create a template. So this is written in HTML. In the inside of the HTML document, I've written this template because this post we can think about Slack once again. So, uh, as soon as someone is posting something in, in the Slack client, I want to create a post like this and add it to the client. So, so I will need to do a lot of, of creating posts. Then I could render the, this one in HTML, connect the CSS to the class active and, and all of that. Yes, like normal HTML. But instead of just adding it to the HTML, I add it inside of a template element. And this template element is a special element in HTML because the rendering engine will, will totally ignore everything that is in between. It will just skip the template. It will see, oh, a template, and then it will start rendering after the template. The template will not be shown in any way on the HTML page. So it's a safe place to put, put this kind of code that you somewhere down the line needs to use. Okay, 
So we have this in HTML and then we do a let template equals document query selector post template. So we get a reference to this template element. And then we create a clone using the clone node that we talked about before. So I take the template, I take the content of the template, everything inside of the template. I don't want to clone the template itself. I only want the content inside of the template. Otherwise, if I insert this template on another page, it will not never render. So I need the content inside of the template. Could probably do template dot first element child dot clone node true because we want a deep copy. We want to copy everything inside of, of this div. Uh, then I get a clone and then I take the body element and I pen the clone inside of the body and it will end up in, in the end of the body element or whatever, wherever we would like to place it. A much nicer way of pushing out content in the browser. Uh, this is a built-in template engine since I'm not sure how, I'm actually not sure, let's see. Uh, template string, HTML templates, yeah, it goes back pretty far in time. We have a good support everywhere. Not in Internet Explorer, but other than that, it's, it's good support. Uh, there are libraries that do this for you, like mustache, underscore, templates, handlebars, pug. There are a lot of, of templates engines that you can use, but if you can do it in standard mode in the browser without any libraries, well, why not? Well, there are certainly some limitations to this this way of doing it and you have probably if you're using some of those libraries you have broader support and things like that but this is what I will focus on in the course I'm uh, throughout this course I will kind of not look at libraries uh, I, I always I've gotten the question for like 10 years why don't we uh, learn jQuery because you don't need jQuery uh, that's why so, so, so I try to, to kind of teach the standard way of doing stuff. Sometimes you will need to use libraries to have a fallback, but those libraries change all the time. The standard are probably there to stay, so that's why. Okay, templates. Uh, use them. Uh, and this is what I said that s s some of you will be afraid to use the template because you need to remember this, those three lines of code. You, well, you don't need to remember, you need to have a bookmark on this page or on the Scylla page. But how to clone a template, just bookmark it and, and, and use templates. You will be so much easier off. And we will probably ask you on the, on the examination, oh, why didn't you use templates? Oh, well, I don't know why I didn't. I used in HTML and then we will insert some bad code into your application and you will be so sorry. So try to use templates, they are not that bad. I will just like to show one thing. <laughs> now I'm, 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 I'm doing exactly what I said I shouldn't. I'm using inner HTML. Uh, so you can create templates using JavaScript without being in the HTML page by doing a create element on a template like that and then I use inner HTML to populate the template with HTML elements. Uh, this is kind of adding HTML to inside of the JavaScript which breaks every rule I've talked about concerning uh, separation of concern. However, if I back up to this one, this way of structuring your applications in HTML, CSS and JavaScript, I've probably said it before, but that is kind of like sorting Lego by color. So, and that is a perfectly good way of sorting Lego if, if, you, if you want, but maybe you want to sort the Lego instead out of applications. So every part for cars or, or vehicles in one box and 
all parts for houses in one box. That is another way of sorting Legos. So, so this is not the only truth that you should always separate HTML, CSS and JavaScript. There are certain cases when it could actually be, be, be clever to sort it by functionality rather than by, by uh, uh, file uh, uh, ending. If you look in, in React applications, for instance, or any other um, um, framework, you will probably see that you mix, tend to mix HTML and JavaScript a lot. And we will start to talk about something called custom elements soon. Uh, and that to get a good, nice structure on those custom elements, it could actually be a good thing to do stuff like this. It's not optimal, but it, it has its trade-offs. And we will actually get to that now, I think. Uh, but maybe we should have a break. Uh, so after the break, I will not code a larger example, but I will talk about this larger example. Uh, and we will see how we can structure and organize our code. So 10 minutes break. <laughs> Uh, in the course, when, when I used to have this lecture surrounding the DOM, I used to call this, this lecture Once Upon a Time in Springfield. Uh, and then we kind of had the DOM, the events and timers and stuff, all crammed into one uh, lecture. And I was able to, to live code an example as well in that lecture. Uh, and that example is called Bartboard. Uh, and that example is nowadays an exercise instead. So, so it is an exercise with instructions. However, I have an extended demo uh, coding that Bartboard. Uh, and in that one, uh, you are supposed to create, basically you are supposed to create this board, uh, this uh, blackboard where Bart is supposed to be able to write the same sentence over and over and over again, looking something like this. Uh, so if we have a look at this, this, this application, it's only kind of a div element. The blackboard is a div element with some styling with borders and a background uh, color. And then all of this text is added to, to that element. And then when you press the mouse button, it should start writing letter for letter. And when you, you release the mouse button, it should stop. That is for next week when we talk about events and how to trigger things depending on what the user does. But in this, I mean, for today's lecture, you would be able to create this out of nothing, right? You would be able to create a div element, uh, add a class called board or something like that, and add it to the document and create text nodes and add those text nodes to that div element. Oh, sorry, I always forgot to press the button, but now you will see it. Um, however, I mean, that is, that is a totally legit way of doing it. Nothing wrong with that. And you, if you want to create, I mean, you can encapsulate that into a class. So you have a class called Bartboard. And when you instantiate a new class, that class will create the element, inject it into the DOM on a place that you have chosen. You, could, you can do all of that with the knowledge you have. However, there is a cleaner way of doing it or a, a way, there is a better looking way of doing it. So if you have a look at this line, wouldn't it be neat to have your own HTML element called Bartboard and just be able to write it in the HTML as it is, like that. And, and the Bartboard will show up, basically creating your own elements, your own HTML elements. And you are, you're able to do that with something called custom elements. Uh, this is kind of new. Don't mind the second uh, zero version. The version one is the one that is. Uh, so you can see that 
Firefox will start supported in the next media release. It's still it's supported, but you need to add a flag uh, to the browser if you want to try it out. Chrome has supported it since uh, version 67. Safari is kind of supporting it. They have a bug uh, on, on, on certain things, but it's pretty well supported. And even the Samsung browser is supporting it. Uh, but it's fairly new. Uh, but with custom elements, you can create your own elements. You, you might need, I mean, think about Spotify or, or, or Slack. In Spotify, for instance, you have, um, you have quite clear components if you look at, at the application. You have some kind of player controls. You have some kind of uh, carousel of, of uh, uh, record uh, uh, covers, for instance, and, and, and you have a search bar, and you have. So, so, so if you start to analyze ap applications, you will find that they are a lot of small components, and it would be really neat if those components could be described with just a simple HTML element. It would be so much easier to positioning stuff in the browser when you just could like have those element uh, as elements you would also increase use of, uh, reusability a lot if you could l like write re reusable components and share them in, in in some kind of library that is called web components and it's a fairly new concept well it has a couple of years uh, at least uh, since si si since it started but it's not re we are not there yet. The browser support is still quite poor. Uh, well, custom elements works kind of, but, but there are certain other things that don't. And we will actually go through all of those in separate lecture or in, in another lecture. But I would like to introduce custom elements right now because I think custom elements is a perfect way for you to package your code because one, thing that people said last year and the year before was that it was quite hard to code in the browser because you had no clear rules of how to package the code and how to begin and how to end. You can do it in so many different ways. The same thing as with JavaScript. So you have a language JavaScript that is really free and then you have all of those APIs. You can do things in many different ways. So, so it was asked to have a way of structuring your code in, in, in an easier way in this course. And, and I think, at least, that custom elements is one of those solutions. At least when we, we've tried this on, on Kalma students that will take this next, uh, before Christmas. Uh, and, and they tried it last year and they, were, uh, they gave it a thumbs up bef because they, they felt that it really gave them a way of, 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 of structuring their code. So we will have a look at how, how we can do this. So in this case, I'm, I'm creating a Bartboard and I'm, I want to add uh, this text as an attribute. You can do it in many different way, but ways, but this is how I chose them. Uh, I'm in the examples. I will go through this step by step as well and code it and we will look in the browser what happens. So I will just introduce it now and look at my examples and demos because you will see me coding it there. So there are some things you need to do cr to create your own elements. The first one being you need to create a constructor function or if you like a class, even though saying that we have class in JavaScript, that is a little bit so-so, but this is the easiest way of doing it. You could use prototype, prototypical inheritance and things like that, but if you use this syntax, it's quite neat. So we create a class called Bartboard that extends window.html elements. So, so we are basically saying we want to extend uh, a window element, an empty element. Uh, you can, uh, 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 an HTML element, you, you can extend other elements as well. You could extend the video element, for instance, if you want to change the behavior of a video, video component. But we will start out with an empty HTML element uh, we need to tell the browser that we have a new element that it should register and that it should use. And we do that by window.customElements.define. So we're defining a new custom element. 
we must give it a name and we will point to the constructor function or in this case the class dartboard that should be 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 instantiated the from we need to name it with a dash in the middle you cannot name it in camel casing for instance because this dash will uh, tell the browser that this is a custom element so that you will not get conflict with built-in elements so if 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 chrome or if the standard would like in the future to add a bart board to the implementation in all browsers because that has become a thing then it will be named bart and with a uh, as one word bart board not with a dash in between because dash custom elements no dash built-in elements so that's the distinct distinction okay we do that in our javascript file uh, then we uh, inside of our html we can use this bart board text doo -doo -doo -doo, like that and we could even if we like use the dom apis like document create element bart board and we can set attributes and we can work with this element as it were whatever what other element in the world uh, so this is just a simple simple thing however we need to do uh, some stuff to to make it recognize that the the attributes uh, you see i have a dot 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 inside of the class here uh, and that's what we will look at now so when we extend this html elements uh, we need a constructor and we, we need to call the super so we need to call the ht elements constructor uh, in this case to be able to set things up uh, properly uh, properly in uh, in the browser uh, we can override a function called connected callback connected callback or a method the connected callback is called when this element is added to the document basically when you do an append child uh, or when the rendering en engine finds it in the initial parsing of the page then connected callback will be called so so this is kind of a neat place because in this one you know that okay someone has added this element to the document now we can do stuff with element uh, start a network connection if it's a connected element for instance that that should fetch things from a server it's it's unnecessary to do it in the constructor because it might be that you are creating elements without adding them to the DOM and then they probably don't need a network connection until they get added to the DOM. In this one we should do this as well. Uh, we will see if it has the attribute text set. And so basically if someone has done this, text will be I will not pollute the global scope. Uh, and if that is, uh, is the case, uh, we will use that text otherwise we will uh, create uh, a just an empty uh, text uh, node uh, uh, otherwise text will be null and that is n not so nice it will say null 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 on the page uh, if someone says no text it will be empty uh, and then we are adding uh, the text to the text content so so we are adding the text to inside of this BART board. This is just a fancy way of repeating the text 10 times. It's, you, you can do it using a for loop if you like. Okay, uh, so this, this takes care of the initial in initialization. However, if the attribute is changed, if someone dynamically changes the text attribute afterwards, we need to reflect that change back to uh, the text content, right? Uh, and let's see how we do that I've moved instead of doing this initial rendering inside of the connected callback I just moved it to a see my private update rendering so I create a rendering uh, uh, method that will update the text content it's the same thing that we had uh, before and we can override uh, the observed attribute or this one uh, this getter uh, observed attribute you can add that one telling the browser which attributes on your element it should observe 
So, so if someone is changing text, the browser will tell you. But if someone is altering another uh, attribute, the browser will not care. So you're basically, on, on those lines, you're basically telling the browser to watch for changes at the attribute text. And when a change occurs, uh, this method will be called. Attribute changed callback, it must have that name. Uh, that one will be called with uh, the name of the attribute being text, the old value that text had before the change and the new value after the change. And in this case, we're just updating the rendering because then it will fetch that new, but of course you could have sent the new value into the rendering and you know, written. You can do that in so many different ways, but this is just a simple, simple, way of doing it and by this you have made a custom element more or less a component in the browser uh, I would actually urge you to on the the uh, let's see exercises let's back up back up Back up. Tiny Tunes, on Tiny Tunes, it, it, that is just to get you started with the DOM and events, so you could do that as, as it is. Ellen knew it the same way. But after Bartboard, after you've, you've done this, try to use custom elements on, on the rest of the, 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 the exercises. The click game, for instance, this is a game that you will play in the browser by clicking colors. Uh, why not create that as a click game uh, element that you can insert? And you can have several click games at once, for instance. If you do that, you will have an advantage in the third part of the course. So by, by looking at custom elements on the, on the exercises starting now, you will ge get yeah, you will have an advantage uh, on, on the last examination assignment. Remember, do you remember what the last examination assignment was? Was this, where is it? Where's my recording? Oh, there it is. Was this one? Some kind of desktop with, Oh, chat, chat applications, so video application, if you like, uh, memory application, note applications, different kind of applications that you are able to create and move around and stuff. If those were separate components or custom elements, I think you will have a much easier time orchestrating, orchestrating this, this application. And as you will notice, one of the applications here is actually a memory application. This is the memory application. You will click like those images and they will turn. If they are the same, they will be removed. That application corresponds quite neatly to the last exercise in the course. So if you've done that exercise, then you have already fulfilled one of the requirements in the last uh, examination assignment. So that is one, one reason why you shouldn't skip the exercises. And this uh, autocomplete demo, that is just like when you write in Google, you will see that it will add such su suggestions for you. When you write something, it will add suggestions. This is that kind of uh, functionality. Well, maybe you can find a way of, of, of adding this to your last examination assignment as well. So they're not done in vain. Okie doke. Any questions on, uh, on custom elements? This is, we have just touched upon the basics of creating, uh, creating custom elements. We will, will we do that now? Oh, maybe we will. Yeah, <laughs> we will look at something called the Shadow DOM. Um, when, 
when, wh when I've described the DOM, I've described it as, I mean, okay, going back all the way to the top. If we look at this picture, I've described image, and we could have had a video, video element here as one element. If we add a BART board, create our own uh, element, it will be described as one element in this DOM structure. However, if you look at, for instance, can I do this in real time? This is, okay, we will try. This might go to waste, but I hope YouTube is using the video element. Okay, so you can see we have the video element. They have a lot of attributes, but it's a simple element. However, in my, my browser, this is probably not the same in yours. I've, I've actually uh, switched a flag for me being able to see something called a shadow DOM. So behind each element, there is something called a shadow DOM. So each element has its own space, its own universe. So if I open the video element, you will see that it has a div element. So the video element is a div element containing of other div elements containing other div elements, containing input fields of buttons and, and stuff. So the video element on YouTube, or the, the, the usual video element, it's actually its own custom element with a lot of uh, HTML and CSS attached to it in something called a shadow DOM. So the shadow DOM is not visible uh, in the DOM structure, but you can always kind of extract it and, uh, and work with it. Yeah, <laughs> this is what I'm showing here actually. Uh, and that is pretty neat because when you write CSS, you have probably all started thinking about oh, it's a, so so tricky, if I just want to, to change things inside of my little application, I might take into consideration that I cannot change all piece because that will affect everything on the page. I can only change things that are under my own ID or something like that, or under the this class name or something like that. But if we move the CSS from the original CSS file and place those inside of the shadow DOM, they will live in inside DOM and only affect things inside of that element, that custom element. Uh, so this one, I'm creating a template, and this is where this comes in again with uh, creating templates using inner HTML. So I'm creating an element, a template element, and I'm inserting inner HTML to this one. Uh, I'm adding a style like that. That's totally allowed to add a style like that should avoid it, but in this case it's pretty good. By doing the and pseudo class host, I will point to, in this case, the board element. So by doing host, I will reach the board, and I could set that background to something. I could add a P inside of the board board, where the text should show up. I could do that one. I could but if I were to style this P element, I could just write color red and it will affect this one, but nothing outside of, of the custom element. So it's inside of this element. Then I create my BART board, kind of the same as last uh, time I've updated some things. I this, this dot attach shadow. So I'm telling um, the browser that this custom element wants a shadow DOM calling a touch shadow. I will use mode open. You will probably all know that. There is a closed, closed uh, shadow DOM as well. Uh, I'm really not sure what that does. So just use the mode open in, in this case. Uh, and to the shadow root of this element, it has a shadow root, we will append a child and I clone the child. And it will take all of this 
just insert it into my BART uh, custom element. And CSS will be, when we do this on node, the CSS will render as well. And I'm, yeah, I'm just updating so text will be, be, be written in uh, Bartboard text instead in this one, in that P element. Don't need to worry about using IDs because this will be part of this uh, uh, component. So even if multiple Bart boards on the page, they will select the one inside of the shadow root in my element or my uh, custom element. And as I said before, something now we are looking at something called web elements. There is a good web, uh, website, I've, I've linked it on the course webpage, that is called Web Components. Web Components is, 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 is a name for this type of behavior. Custom elements together with the shadow DOM um, to build our uh, yeah, components. They have a lot of practices. We've tried to kind of cook them practices together and looked at the examples when we have constructed our way in this. Um, it's a fairly new standard. There are things that I like to change. Uh, there are something called HTML that we could use together with the components. We can components into the browser. Uh, but the support is really poor and I even think that Safari has flagged for not implementing that at all, that kind of concerns for uh, optimization and, uh, uh, and uh, with that kind of behavior. But we've tried our best anyways. You're, I would really like feedback this way of doing it when you start looking at smartboard example, for, for instance. So if you have feedback, please send it to me other ways, smarter ways of doing this without using libraries, that, that, that and frameworks. Of course, they have coded in, in like React or Vue or, 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 or any other framework, you will probably start seeing, oh, but that looks kind of like how you do that in React or, or you can use web components using Polymer, for instance. Polymer is a, um, a, a that that Google has done to to, to support this in every uh, web components, but to learn Polymer and how they are, I want to do it using libraries. Yeah. I think this will be a big thing, and it's becoming a big thing for web development. We need a good way of distributing. Uh, reusing components um, so uh, and this I think this is a way for you to start if you have never been on the web before I think this is your guidelines and, and, and quite best practice and then you could like, start experimenting with with client side uh, on your own but that if you have any any comments or um, Thing regarding this, I'm to to uh, have questions or post in Slack or send me a or whatever. Okay, any questions regarding? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Backticks. <laughs> I forgot this in in, uh, in about strings. So it's a backtick. It's not a single quote. It's not a double quote. It's a. If you if you, if you examine your your key, you will find it somewhere. Uh, where it is on Mac, it's it's Dell or uh, erased, uh, and the question mark. Uh, you're using that one as well. If you're writing code, please do it. So if you're writing code, uh, add backticks and the code will get a pretty output. In JavaScript, if you have a string, 
spends that uses uh, 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 like this. So I have a string on my lines. If you use a uh, this will work. If you are using single, no, I can't. If you're using a quote in this case, uh, the, the automatic colon inserter will will my colon and end end the deal. Uh, but using you could have a string this. Uh, you, you would have to add some kind of slash in the end or something to indicate that we have a new line. So if you want to do things like that. There are even, uh, 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 you can use parents in, in backtick strings in, in a good way. Maybe because I have a couple of minutes. Uh, Bob. Do I have a? Uh, okay, so I have a simple. App.js. Now we're in Node, but it doesn't matter actually. Blue. A very simple to show what you can do with the back. You can use this parameter syntax to, to insert uh, things from outside of the to the stream. So it 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 it, it inserts, uh, uh, the name in the stream. You use a regular. You would have to do it like welcome. Space name plus this so this is a better syntax thing that and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that passed or as well this one indicate that string stuff probably optimize but it's probably the way I often want to do it. Eight strings. I follow you I think. In this in this example we are using Bactic. So what I would like to do with this with I told yet is to the problem writing a side of a JavaScript that is the ID you will not recognize that this is HTML, so it will not color colorize it and indent it in the in the query. So it would be nice if you could have a small HTML for this this content and then just put that HTML for uh, doing that but clean way doing requests to the server. Um, hello, that might I'm, I'm looking into actually. Um, but I will tell you if I way for this course, this is I think so. I have like I think 10. What 
today manipulating what we've done. That doesn't make rockets fly. It's only like, okay, so the page and then the page, so it looks like a static page once again. I mean, it's it's quite less to do this. For next week or morning, we will do something called events. And events is for you to act upon things happening in the So you can react upon a user clicking, dragging, scrolling the writing on the board, things updating on the server, react to events. And when you react on events, you can change the so, so, so if it's writing something on a browser, you can send a message to the server and, and back to the browser. You can insert uh, an nice message. And then you start doing, doing exciting stuff. But this is essential. You will to modify the DOM. That is what we will do all the time. So speak, we will start looking at events as we look at the concept because it goes hand in hand. We will look into concept asynchronous asynchronous programming. Uh, and it's probably of those things that will feel good for you with a background. You're quite used Running program should wait. You might have threads, but JavaScript we don't have. We don't have threads. Um, single threaded. Have another mechanism. Asynchronous program uh, called. Can, yeah, we will. We will have a lot uh, week as well. But the concept that is, if it's something really important. I mean, if you if you ask this way of good, because probably that people has artists to to grab how happening in the browser chronously and to program against things happening in the order are happening, being able to stop the execution code in the middle of a thing, then that will be restore something has happened it's like that we will look at that as well uh, after the lecture you will be able to, to do the examination as well. so please uh, watch this one you can watch now or in this you can watch uh, in the Swedish if you're in, you can watch the English it doesn't matter it's the same uh, from last year. I don't know why it says 2007. But events, I call that one uh, for, uh, in a question. Wrong with this recording, but I would like to ask the English version, at least. English version should be up because it's new. Questions? You had no questions. Then we will add you and by six. Okay? Thank you.